All right, well, guys. Well, welcome to the Sports Guys this week. We're really glad you're here. Uh, Rob, welcome back. Hope you had a good time on the cruise. Had a great time. That's awesome. I'm really happy to hear it. We did our best to kind of fill in for you while you were gone. Um, we are here this week to talk about one of our favorite topics, which is March Madness basketball. Some people call it bracketology. You can see Rob's got a bracket behind him. And uh, we're really excited to talk to you about this topic this week. Uh, it actually kicked off the main games today. There have been a lot of today already, and we'll talk about some of those. Then we'll get into um, some of the pundits out in the field's brackets, talk a little bit about theirs. We're going to talk about my bracket, talk about Rob's bracket, and uh, hopefully this helps you guys a little bit if you're trying to fill out your current brackets right now. Maybe we can give you some little tidbits of things to think about. So best time of the year, Robbie. You remember two years ago we were in Vegas? Yeah. And we uh, – we're walking around the strip in Vegas during March Madness, and I'm, I'm never going to forget. You could see all 64 fan bases walking around with their yeah sweatshirts, sweatshirts from every school, and it was so it was, fun. It was awesome. It was that was such a cool. We were week. going into different sports books and you know putting ten dollars down on this game, and right. it was really fun. Yeah, exactly. So Rob was just ridiculing me that I had Virginia behind me here, but uh, you know what? I'm going to stick with my team, even though they completely embarrassed the fan base two days ago. But um, the, way, the way I look at it is, I love the team too. I'm just letting them lie quietly and and regroup. <laughs> I'm not flying my Virginia flag right now. I'm just let's just quietly regroup. He's got his NC State on, and he's going to talk about basketball. But anyway, we're going to try to break down some of the ten stories that are coming at us here as we enter March Madness. What an amazing three weeks! It's basically a huge basketball festival. I was telling Rob earlier today that maybe it should be a national holiday, at least the Thursday and Friday of the first weekend, because to me, there's just nothing better. I mean, everyone's taking two, three hour lunches. They're going to early happy hours. They're in sports bars with all their friends. Just doesn't get any better than this. What are your thoughts? At work, I work down the hall. I hear people go, ah, <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. I know what's happening. Uh, so that's funny. Yeah. And, and you think they're working, but they're really not. <laughs> well, they're working, but then they're checking on stuff. And I mean, I was doing it too. So, I mean, also the, the age of sports betting has arrived in North Carolina where we live. And, yep. uh, you know, just in time for March Madness, everybody's on their phones and they're picking their bets. And, and even if you only bet 20 bucks or something, everyone's got their favorite team. They think going to make it all the way to the final four or to the, yeah. the championship game. So it's going to be fun to talk to you about this. So let's talk about topic number one. This These are the, kind of the big stories going into March Madness, according to the pundits. The first one is, can UConn repeat? Um, nobody has done it uh, in a long time, since 2007, when Florida got their second championship under Billy Donovan. Ironically, um, the current coach for UConn, um, Dan, uh, he's actually a real huge fan of Billy Donovan, and he was back then, Dan Hurley. And... Um, he used to follow him and really kind of uh, worship him because he wanted to go into the coaching business. Well, all these years later, Dan Hurley, apparently after last year's win by UConn to win the national championship, he actually called Billy Donovan in the off season and asked him how to approach year two. You know, how do you approach trying to repeat when you basically have the same roster, but it's much harder in year two. So apparently Billy Donovan gave him a lot of good advice of how to approach and keep the guys motivated. Anyway, what are your what are your thoughts? Can UConn repeat unlike most teams? I think not. Um, it's very possible, but I'd say the field has a higher likelihood. Um, everyone's giving you your best shot. Um, there's just so much pressure on every game. Um, and then you multiply that by several times for a repeating champion. And I just think it, it becomes too much. <clears throat> I do have them going pretty deep in the tournament, but I think they're just going to get knocked off by one of the be better teams along the way. And I don't think they repeat. I think it's it's really few and far between when it, when the team's able to do it. I mean, if you were going to be able to um, bet either UConn or the field, the field. I, also, I also would choose the field, even though I'm picking UConn to win this tournament and repeat. But if, if you were to make me bet that, I would bet the field just because it is so hard. I will say that UConn uh, has basically their entire team back intact from last year, and they have two really phenom freshmen. 
So they've actually added, they may be a better team than they were last year. And honestly, their bracket is not impossible. <laughs> so That's true. Not impossible, though. There are some really good teams. There's some landmines for them in that. Well, in there's that. some nice teams in there, but, you know, it's an uphill battle when you're trying to repeat. But, but I got, think their bracket was a little bit kind. They have Tristan Newton. They've got Cam Spencer. Um, these are all guys who are champions from last year. Of course, Hassan Diara was a kind of a star last year as a guard. Uh, Samson Johnson. They have their freshman forward, Jalen Stewart, who uh, everyone thought wasn't going to be a big factor this year, but he's been, just been unbelievable off the bench as their sixth man. Um, they were number one to start the season, and they were number one to finish the season. They were literally wire to wire number one. They remind me a lot of that Virginia team in 2019. Um, they they've been preseason number one, preseason or number one all the way through the season, and now they're the, not only the number one seed in their bracket, but the number one overall seed. So to me, if there's any team in this tournament that has a chance to repeat, it would be UConn. Um, to me, the top three teams in this field are UConn, Purdue, and North Carolina. I think those are the best three teams. Um, and so I think those three have the best chance of winning. Any other thoughts on UConn's repeat? Um, I think it's pretty wide open for them, but I don't think they're going to get it done. Well, when we go through the bracket, I'd love to hear who you think is going to stop them because um, – I, I don't really see anybody at this point who's in their class, but we'll see. Story number two, Purdue could finally get back to the Final Four after 44 years. Purdue has not made it to the Final Four in 44 years, and this is after three straight very disappointing years. Last year they lost to Fairleigh Dickinson, which was the number 16 team. They were only the second number one seed ever to lose to a 16 after Virginia did to UMBC. The year before they did that, they lost to a number 15 seed, St. Peter's. And the year before, they lost to a number 14 seed. So three years in a row, it just got worse and worse. And in every one of those years, they were actually in a better position to win. So my question is to this one, if they do get back to the Final Four, what is it about this year's team that's going to get them there? Well, I think this team is uh... – I think it's got some balance. I, I like some of their offensive and defensive stats and their pieces. Um, I think some of those losses actually propel you into the victories. I think that's what helped Virginia get over the top. Um, you know, the, the Virginia players were walking around campus that whole year after losing to UMBC with their hoodies on around campus and their, and their, and their earbud. They were real focused. And um, I think the losses hurt so badly, but they actually – um, you know, Tony Bennett talks about how those losses um, give you a ticket to go places you would never go without them. So, yep. you know, I, I think, um, you know, while I don't think there's a runaway favorite in this tournament, um, Purdue is my favorite. Uh, okay. and, I, and I and I don't do that because they've been so close so many times. But I just think that uh, they've got a, a, an, an incredible player probably the best player in the country. Um, they've got um, a nice team. They have lots of experience. They have the bitter taste in their mouth, so they're not going to get unfocused. Uh, and they're, they're, they they got to be a little hungry, you know. they got to be a little bit scared and a little hungry. And um, and then I have other reasons, too, that we'll talk about later. Uh, but I think, um, I think Purdue's got a good shot, um, you know, any single team or the field, I would take the field. So there's no doubt, you know, but but if you have to pick one, that's who I'm picking. That makes sense. And and Purdue, um, just some of their upsides. You know, I told you what some of the downsides are. Their mental block. Of course, Virginia had a mental block till they broke it. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is Purdue's year to break it. Um, yep. Their mental block, but they also have the best player in the country in Zach Eady. Yep. Um, he's a he's a dynamic center. He can score. He can play defense. He he has the capability like a um, Jokic of doing triple doubles. I mean, he's got that yeah. kind of capability. Apparently, he's going to be a consensus top three pick in the NBA um, if he goes out this year, which he probably will. Uh, he was player of the year in the NCAA last year and will be again this year. So he'll be the first two-time winner of that award since Ralph Sampson. Um, so that that's what they have going for them. Um, 
in their losses this year and the times that they've struggled have been when the other teams collapse down in kind of a box and one on him mm -hmm. and really, really make him struggle for the ball in the middle of the lane and force the Purdue shooters to, to hit shots. And so my, my real question about can they win six in a row in that scenario? Because everyone's yeah. going to try to surround Edie with, with all their tall guys. They're going to go big and they're going to try to force Purdue to shoot. I personally don't think so. I think they're going to get knocked off either in the in the lead eight or maybe the final four. I do think they'll go Any, somewhat deep. Anytime you, anytime you have a, a dominant big man, <clears throat> you have this situation that they're in. Uh, Ralph Sampson's team's had them. Um, Ewing, et cetera. What you have is teams doubling down and, and, and doing box and one and all those different ways of techniques of, of really bottling up one huge guy and somebody else is going to have to step up and it really comes down to whether they can or not. And I think mm -hmm. there's enough players on the team who've tasted some of that, the losses. That's what drives you in the gym in the off season, that bitterness. And I think um, if they channel it right, they so, can do it. So you also have to look at the landmines, right? So you got to win six straight, and you got to look at who's in front of you. So UConn, you know, some of the landmines they have, they have San Diego State, who went to the mm -hmm. Final Four last year. They're a really good team. They have Florida Atlantic, who's kind of the Cinderella every year. They always go mm -hmm. further than they really should. They've got um, Iowa State. Auburn. They've, They've got Illinois and they've got Auburn. So in my opinion, yeah. there's five teams in the East that could beat UConn. There's five teams that could do it. In so, my bracket, I have Auburn, Auburn beating them. Okay. It's possible. So yeah, so Purdue, ha possible. Purdue, ha Purdue has a very similar situation. They, uh, they have Tennessee. They have Creighton. They have Kansas. Okay. I would say all three of those teams could knock off Purdue for sure. Mm -hmm. Um so again, it's you know, are they well positioned? Yes. Do they have the best player in the country? Yes. That gives them I, a big advantage. I think Creighton and Tennessee are going to battle, and so the winner of that is going to be probably who Purdue has to get through to get into the the uh, Final Four. Absolutely. So they do have to fight Gonzaga as well. So I mean, it's it's a tough. They have a much harder bracket than than UConn does. Somewhat, although. I think I there's think. more. I think there's more teams that could beat UConn in the East than Purdue. Okay. Purdue really only has, in my opinion, yeah, three teams that could beat them. But I wouldn't want to be in a uh, bracket with Texas, Creighton, Kansas, Gonzaga, and TCU. Kansas, <laughs> Kansas has three of their four top players out. Can, I know. Kansas, they Kansas, they're going to lose in the second round. Kansas is not that yeah. good. Yeah, but still, they're going to. Yeah. They're going to. You know. They're going to be athletic and yeah. So next story is Gonzaga has made it to its 25th consecutive NCAA tournament appearance. I mean, if he's not one of the best coaches in basketball, maybe of all yes. time, um, the Zags coming from really a, a mid-level conference and year after year, they do it going to the final four, going to the final game in previous years. Um, this year's team, they've always considered the entire season to be a little bit down. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, having watched them win today, I don't know. I, I wouldn't want to play them. Uh-uh. You don't want to play them. They always have experience. They have a great coach. They have a really good program. And they got to be a little hungry if, if they're having this mediocre season. You know, it's – they will lose, but, you know, you don't want to be next. <laughs> That's right. No doubt about it. Well – uh, next story I've got here is Kansas. They're in the top four of their region again uh, for the seventh straight season. But again, like I said, they're really banged up. They're actually the most injured team coming into this yeah. tournament. Um, UConn actually is the healthiest team coming into this tournament, which doesn't seem fair with their already loaded roster and their depth. But um, the Jayhawks are always a tough out, even if they have a couple of good players out. Uh, how far do you think they can make it this year? How far you five, five stars yeah. everywhere, like usual. Um, I have Gonzaga beating them, but I think um, that's a rough division <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. or part of the bracket. Um, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if Kansas took Gonzaga. I don't know, but um, they're going to lose somewhere in there around Sweet 16. Uh, so I think they're going to have a nice tournament. They're, they're, you know, 
a blue blood program and, and they're going to be just really difficult to knock out. You have to knock them out to, to really take your shot at the, at the final four. So. You can't completely discount them, but I do think this is probably their, their weakest shot um, in quite a long time. Um, Kansas because of the injuries. So. Yeah. So next uh, story is the Rick Barnes bowl in Charlotte. <laughs> So this one's kind of an interesting one to me. Rick Barnes used to be for many, many years, the coach of Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and he went to 16 NCAA tournaments out of 17 when he was the coach of Texas. So he had a really great year. He was um, Kevin Durant's coach, um, had a great record there and then left there and went to coach University of Tennessee uh, in Knoxville. And um, if both those teams win their first round matchups, and of course, Texas just won theirs. Uh, they're going to meet in Charlotte in the second round. It'll be Tennessee versus Texas, and they're calling it the Rick Barnes Bowl. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a particularly good game. I really do. Both teams are very good, very solid, yeah. can score, can play defense. Um, but, yeah, yeah that'd be an interesting If Tennessee match. takes care of business against St. Peter's, uh, Texas-Tennessee right. will be a very exciting uh, matchup. Second round game to try to get to the Sweet 16. Yeah. Yeah, the Rick Barnes Bowl. That'll be fun. <laughs> yeah. uh, another story is North Carolina and Michigan State seem to be on a collision course. Um, if they win their first couple of game, uh, games, they are going to meet in the Sweet 16 potentially. And, you know, those are just two heavyweights of this tournament year after year. Two mm -hmm. great co coaching matchups and great player matchups. What are your thoughts? Who, who has the edge in that game? Well, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I feel like UNC probably does. Um, I think Michigan State's just a tiny bit down this year, but it's it's just like Kansas. You don't want to play them in the tournament. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of Izzo. I think um, his his record in the tournament is pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. um, even though he hasn't won it many times, he certainly does a lot of damage. And um, But I think Carolina – I was actually – looking through statistics and they were surprisingly high in offensive categories um, and also in rebounding. So they are uh, a well-rounded team. They have some really high, high level scorers. Uh, they're kind of gelling a little bit. I think they had um, a difficult time with NC state physically, mm -hmm. um, but I think they're, they're slated to to be a real dangerous team in the tournament, so that should be a great one. One of the better uh, matchups in the in the if the if it lines up like that, um, Carolina and Michigan State would be a, a real good one. Of course, you have both teams were loaded with five stars. Um, yeah. The, the last time they met in the tournament was in 2009 in the national championship game. That game was in Detroit, Michigan, and of course, uh, Michigan State had a huge home court advantage. The crowd was very pro. Pro Spartan. Yeah. Um, this they both game, have a nice mix of veterans and young stars. And so, you know, they can draw on the experience and they can also use those fresh legs and that energy. Um, right. It's kind of perfect what you want, really. You don't want all veterans. You don't want all freshmen. That's um, right. This year, if they do meet in the Sweet 16, it'd be in Charlotte, North Carolina, my hometown. Um, you can imagine who uh, was the home crowd is going to favor. I have to think it's going to be a massive Tar Heel yeah. in the crowd there. So that'll be really interesting to watch. Um, the next game that's really interesting to me is the Caleb Love game. <laughs> and it actually could decide the whole West bracket. And that is, you know, Love was a star with North Carolina for two years and then left and went to Arizona and is now the stud point guard for Arizona is, is projected to be a lottery pick was mm -hmm. of course replaced by RJ Davis in North Carolina, who's also projected to be a lottery pick. I think RJ Davis myself is the best point guard in the country. He's better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's some people that think actually Caleb loves better than RJ Davis. I think it's pretty close, mm -hmm. but I think our, I, I would take RJ Davis. I don't think um, it's that close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, it'll be interesting to, to see. I'd love to have Caleb Love on my team, but I, I just think yeah. RJ Davis is uh if if North Carolina can get by Michigan State in the in the Sweet 16, 
they next in the Elite Eight would meet Arizona, and that's going to be the they call it the Caleb Love Bowl. Um, mm-hmm. There's going to be some re- real desire on his part to get revenge, of course. So it'll be real interesting to watch that. Next story is uh, James Madison. Uh, can they start the tournament just like it did in starting the season when they upset a Big Ten team at, to start the year? That really, for the Dukes, uh, was an, a shocker when they upset Michigan State at the buzzer to start the season. Uh, that was actually in East Lansing, so it was a home game for Michigan State yep. back in November. And now they yep. face now they face Wisconsin, who you know came off a really strong showing in the season and in the Big Ten tournament. But what do you think uh, JMU's chances are? Uh, I like it. I mean, I I, I picked them to beat Wisconsin. Um, I looked at their stats, and they're they look good on paper and and to the eyeball. I mean, they beat Michigan State, Buffalo, ODU, Coastal Carolina, and Marshall. So mm-hmm. that's a pretty nice resume. It's it's um it's better than a lot of the mid majors who have these incredible shining records, but you find out that they played um, really, really weak teams. So um, that's a pretty decent one. They got second place in the Sun Belt. Um, they're, they're, uh, they score 83 points a game, so they're good offensively, and they give up 69.5. So that's a pretty good spread, um, which gives you some room to deal with runs against you. Um, they are 31 and three overall and 19 and three in their conference. So they've just been really dominant, really doing a nice job winning games. They're supposed to win, but that's not always so easy. And mm-hmm. uh, I feel like they're one of the more exciting um, teams. This is actually one of the, this is the matchup that I'm the most excited about is JMU Wisconsin. They both have mm-hmm. really similar stars. Um, the, uh, um, the star for, uh, for JMU is Terrence Edwards. He's a six mm-hmm. six sophomore, and the um, the star for uh, Wisconsin is AJ uh, Store, and he's six seven sophomore. Um, mm-hmm. They both score really well, effectively, um, seventeen point four points and sixteen point nine. So very very comparable. Um, they can create their own shots. It's gonna be a it's it's my number one. Um, sort of sleeper game that I'm that I'm the most excited about. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be a really cool sleeper game too. I completely agree with you. I want the uh, JMU to win. I just, uh, I actually don't think it's going to happen. I think Wisconsin yeah. is playing really, really solid. Wisconsin basketball. is favored by five and a half. Yep. And I personally think it's going to come down to the wire. I think um, JMU, you know, has played a few teams in the Wisconsin um, yep. caliber and they've held their own. Uh, so it's not a slam dunk at all, uh, so to speak. But they're exciting. They're 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 fresh on the scene. It's really mm-hmm. cool. Uh, they'll be excited to be there. And I just think that's going to be a really exciting. Um, they've proven they can do it. I mean, they've yeah. this year, this yeah. season with this team. So I'm excited they to see. Have, they actually have better numbers than Wisconsin, um, mm-hmm. whose um, point differential is a lot closer: seventy five point one and sixty nine point nine. So Wisconsin has more losses, um, but they're playing in a harder conference. So Wisconsin has more impressive wins. They beat uh, Virginia, Marquette, Michigan State twice, Iowa, Nebraska, Ohio State, Indiana, and Purdue. So that's Mm -hmm. a better resume. Yeah, that's right. Um, But I think anybody who takes JMU lightly is going to be very sad (laughs) because I think they've they've got just enough to to knock off anybody in front of them. So I, I'm excited. You know, Wisconsin should beat them um, with the athletes they have and everything, but I don't know. Their stars are comparable. They're both um, sort of under the radar. Mm-hmm. And uh, Wisconsin being favored, you know, maybe that's just Wisconsin enough. is is one of those teams that they, they kind of grind you down. They're like the old Virginia teams. They play really yeah. solid defense. Uh, and they and they just kind of grind you down. And uh, yeah, they're 110th in scoring in the country. So they're they have, you know they have, in the of, they have a lot of big bodies. They rebound well. Uh, they play solid defense. I think they're going to kind of wear they, team you down towards the end of the game. They were fifth in the Big Ten, so they they had a lot of losses. They were 22 and 13. Um, mm-hmm. So there were a lot of 
a lot of games um, that they that they dropped, and fourteen yeah. and ten in their own conference is um, that's almost five hundred. I mean, it's you know what? It's upset alert. Kind of a Jamie, miracle Jamie, Jamie in, can do it. in the tournament, to be honest. Jamie, you can do it. It's upset alert. Yeah. Yeah. So next one yeah. is if next one is if Kentucky plays Marquette in the Sweet Sixteen in the South. It'll be their 11th tournament meeting, more than any other two programs playing each other. 11 times they will have played. The next um, most matchups is seven, which mm. is North, North Carolina and Michigan State. So pretty amazing that Kentucky and Marquette, I guess they've just been blue blood programs all the way through. That's why they've met so many times. Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting. Although Kentucky's losing right now, so they might not, <laughs> might not even make it past the first round. Well, that's what's interesting is we're doing this this podcast uh, at a time where a few of these games have been played, but most have not. So yeah. we are still looking, you know, forward into the abyss. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, as we speak, we're probably wrong somewhere, but it's kind of fun this way, honestly. I'm kind of glad that's, we're doing it on day one. I really wanted to do yeah. it today. Because we're right in the middle of the action. It's exciting. Yeah. There's yeah. been some losses already. Most mm -hmm. of the games are in front of us in round one. Um, a few of them are going on right now, so it's real tempting to, you know, turn around and take a look at the TV over there. Um, I actually, I actually have my best bracket so far. I think I've ever had. I've only lost one so far, and that's the Dayton game. I really thought Nevada was going to win that game. But, yeah, I uh, picked Nevada. I picked yeah. Nevada. So that was a surprising loss, but you know, you're going to have those. Uh, sure. I saw recently that um, after the first eight games played today, that. 95% of the ESPN brackets are already busted. And, yeah. No, I've, and, I've heard that you're 50 times more likely to win the $100 million Powerball lottery than you are to get a perfect bracket. Wow. 50 and times nine, more likely. And, <laughs> so, and 92% and and of the Yahoo brackets are busted already. This is after eight games. This isn't yeah. close to the first round. So you can imagine how yeah. decimated. It's just fun to try and see how long you can hang in there, you know? Yeah. And how many guys uh, you have. Yeah. And so, it's difficult. Uh, so next one is uh, Houston. Uh, we'll have to go through a bunch of blue bloods to get to the final four. So um, they've got to get through Duke. They've got to get through Kentucky. They have a bunch of landmines in their way, uh, Houston. So what, what are your thoughts about the Houston Cougars this year? They've been very close the last couple of years, gone to the final four. Samson's a really great coach. A lot of people yeah. consider him to have a similar style to Tony Bennett, very defensive in nature, scored just enough to win, very tough, good rebounding. So Houston, I have them going to the Final Four. Okay. Um, they're the number one defense in the country um, in terms of scoring defense. They uh, have incredible athletes, and for most of the year, they've been very, very dominant. Mm -hmm. um, I think the best thing that happened to this team was they got blasted in their conference tournament and they got just downright embarrassed. So I think that made them step back all week and just not be so full of themselves and just really buckle down. I'll bet you they were all listening more in those, in those meetings and, you know, so I just think they're going to, they know that that taste of that, that losing really badly is it lingers for a little while. Um, you know, first round against Longwood, I don't think that's going to be very challenging. Then you've got either Nebraska, Texas A&M. I think that's going to be fine. Um, and then you've got most likely Duke. Um, I don't think it's the roughest path forward. It's not um, an easy path. It's not, it's an, not easy. easy. There's they not an easy path forward in the whole bracket, but um, I think it's easier than what um, Purdue is going to have to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think uh, Houston is is probably going to summon up that dominance that they had and right. do a good job and, and have lockdown defense and um, and get enough offense to uh, to really kind of nail, you know, put people away when they're supposed to. And then anything mm -hmm. happens when you get to the final four. Now you're dealing with the best of the best. So. So the next uh, and last topic, and then we're going to go into the brackets and get into bracketology, which, by the way, is not a perfect science, as we know. Um, 
is North Carolina State, NC State, and you look at Rob's sweatshirt, he's got an NC State sweatshirt on, could be staging a reenactment of 1983. And it, just to remind all of you, it may be the greatest run in a tournament of a team that maybe shouldn't have even been in the tournament all the way through the final and then beating maybe the greatest team I've ever seen, Phi Slamma Jamma and the Houston Cougars. Um, that Wolfpack team that year in that tournament had kept surviving and advancing through a forest of ominous odds and really tough teams, w winning a lot of those games in some cases by one or two points, winning on last second, second buzzer beaters. It was just Cinderella story from beginning to end. Um, and so the question is this bunch this year, uh, finishing out the season, trying to save Keats job, winning seven out of eight, barnstorming through the tournament, winning four games in four days, being North Carolina in the final, becoming ACC champs. Can they continue that momentum and make a deep run in this tournament? What are your thoughts? I don't really think so. Um, I'd love to say yes. I would love to say yes. This is my team now um, that, I'm, that I'm rooting for. I just don't think so. I think – they kind of used up all their good luck um, winning the ACC tournament. They 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 probably should not have gotten by Virginia. They were down in that in that um, last second half court shot to uh, force overtime should not have gone in. I mean, in fact, you know Virginia feels like they should have fouled and and just made them run out of time. Right. Um, so the idea of them winning the ACC tournament took some good fortune in there. Um, and I just don't think you can summon that up again and, and do that kind of magical run through the through the main tournament. So I'd love to see them shock me. And, and I, I really like the guys on the team. I'm a huge Kevin Keats fan. I'm always defending him when people get down on, on Keats. I think he's a really, really good coach. Uh, doesn't always have the best pieces to work with, but um, he makes these good young men uh, into – uh, a good fighting unit that is is tough to play against. They've had a bunch of losses this year. They they would not have been in the tournament had they not won uh, the tournament. So it, they're on a little bit of a they're they're sort of playing with house money. Um, they're, they're, on a, they're on a heater, and the question is, does that? Yeah, they're on a heater. Yeah. I That's think the, the fans. Uh, you know, I live in Raleigh, so I get to uh, experience a lot of the fans. They're they're a little delusional on how um, how much they're ACC champions and because they're they're on this high that they're riding this high where they took out Carolina and they kind of are delusional about they wouldn't be in the tournament if they hadn't. Um, but but you have to say there there is some normal you have to say there is some normal emotion there when you think about Jim Valvano running oh, down yeah. the court and trying to find someone to hug and. And you no, think no, no. That. It's it's more remarkable than that. Uh, when Velvano took over, he had uh, the NC State players um, get a ladder out, and they had practiced cutting the nets down. And nobody was picking them to do anything that year. And they went on to win the national title and cut the nets down. It was a masterclass in uh, sports psychology. Right. And so yeah. there was something special about that team in terms of its psyche. Uh, they were more powerful than they should have been skill wise. Um, mm -hmm. They were, they took on five slam pajama, but they beat a lot of good other good teams. And they basically just were tougher than every other team mentally and physically. They were um, a nightmare to play against uh, inside. They were physical. They were aggressive. They never got tired. They were just amazing. And so mentally and physically, they were strong. I think this team has a lot of elements of that. There's a lot of pieces of that when I see in Keats and um, some of these guys. I mean, DJ Burns is a beast. You know, he's so huge and strong. Um, and he just backs down everybody and, and throws in three-foot little hook shots. Uh, and, he, and he really psychologically damages you because you can't stop it. So, you know, but – do I think that's enough to to put six wins together in a row? I don't think they can do it again. They had to do five to win the ACC tournament, and all think, it needs, all it takes, think, is one loss and you're out. And it's just a really tough tournament to win. I have to think for a team like NC State that barely squeaks in. You know, if you can find a way into the Sweet 16, that's like that's huge. I mean, oh, that's it's unbelievable. 
So you if you get to Sweet 16, it's one of the most successful seasons you've ever had other than your two national titles. Right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I personally actually have them losing in the first round. I, I'm like you. I want them to go to the lead eight. I want them to go to the final four. I want them to have a magical run. I just think, you know, Texas Tech, in my opinion, is one of the better teams and uh, really I have them beating, beating Texas Tech and riding that wave one more time and then losing to Kentucky. So, Okay. Well, I do have an announcement, and that is Kentucky just lost to Oakland. So um, wow, we, have, okay. we have our first massive upset. Okay. And, uh, and that 5% of brackets who are still intact is down to about, what, 0.1% <laughs> now? <laughs> So everyone's brackets are completely decimated, but um, that's the final yeah. part. That is right. Okay. Huh. We'll yeah. see you later there, Kentucky. Um, yep. So, you know, that helps NC State. Obviously, it helps Texas Tech. But, um, you know, maybe they, Oakland has more special uh, team mentally than what we, we were aware of. They were the best shooting team I've seen in a long time. I watched most of the game right before we started the broadcast. And um, yeah. they have a kid on there named Golke who yeah. uh, remind me a lot of J.J. Redick, and they threw everybody they could at him, and he, he just kept hitting and hitting and hitting over and over. Just one of those games. Well, let's uh, go ahead and take a look at some of the brackets that are out there. We're going to show you a couple of the pundits' brackets. We'll analyze kind of their top eight and look and see what they picked, and then uh, I'd love your comments, Rob, on each of these if you think they're right, wrong, off, you know, off track, and we'll just uh, we'll take it from there. So the first one is a guy named Kevin Sweeney, as you can see here. Um, let me go ahead and zoom on in there. You can see his final eight. He had uh, Auburn against Iowa State in the east bracket. So that means that he's thinking UConn gets knocked off a little bit earlier by Auburn. That's, uh, that's had, what I have as well. Yeah, that's then, exactly what I have. And then Kevin Sweeney actually had Auburn going to the final four, and then he had, actually had Auburn going to the final game. So mm. he really like really likes Auburn uh, out of the East. Uh, in terms I like of the, Iowa State to take out Auburn, but that's similar to how I have it. Okay. Uh, out of the West, he's got uh, North Carolina and Baylor. Uh, this is the first uh, bracket I've seen where he really really likes Baylor, and you can see he likes Baylor to get all the way to the Final Four. Um, and then uh, we've got Houston. Coming out of the South after beating Kentucky, of course Kentucky's already gone now. But yeah, uh, he's, got, he's got Houston coming out of the South, and then Midwest he's got Purdue versus Tennessee. That would be a really great matchup, by the way. Those are two really great teams. Dalton mm -hmm. connect with Tennessee is one of the most fun players to watch. Yeah, in college yeah. This year. Um, and he's got Purdue coming out of there, and then he's got Purdue beating Auburn in the final. Any thoughts about this? And uh, any places you think he's wrong? Well, I'm I'm of the mind that Alabama is going to do some damage in this tournament. Um, I just – I wouldn't say he's wrong. I just – Alabama is the highest scoring team in the country. And I think that tends – they have so many different ways they can score that it takes a lot of pressure off. There's something about offenses in the tournament – if if you get really one dimensional in the in the way you score and that's a little bit off, you can start panicking and getting out of sorts. Mm -hmm. um, I think the really high scoring teams um, have a bit of an advantage because they can keep finding the hot guy and the the hot hand, so to speak. And and um, but I, I wouldn't say that he's he's terribly far off. I I had a, a lot of the same ideas um i had purdue against creighton um and i had purdue advancing yeah. Houston against kentucky yeah, and i don't think this, gone, i don't but... see this final four as impossible at all i mean these you know baylor's mm -hmm. been there in the last couple of years um purdue you've talked about as your top pick houston they've been in the top three all season long they're a really great team auburn yep. fantastic they were in the top, top uh, three in the sec really really good team so I don't really have much of a problem with this. I don't quite have these four, and you don't either. But uh, yeah. overall, he's pretty close to. Uh, I can see what his thoughts are, and I, I, yeah. I tend to think similarly. 
I basically have this same bracket, but I've got um, Yukon coming out of the east, and I have North Carolina coming out of the west. I uh, Unlike most years where I try to pick Cinderella's all over the place, this year I, I just have this gut feeling that the Blue Bloods and the big programs are actually going to hold serve more than they usually do. Uh, yeah. Of course, they say that right when Kentucky loses to Oakland. but I know. There's definitely going to be some Blue Bloods that go down. But I will yeah. say that um, this year, more than any I can remember, um, when I'm looking at the mid-major teams, their schedules were very weak. Yeah. And so they're, you know, they're, they're like 31 and three and stuff like that. These right. teams are not, they're not used to playing a grinding schedule. So mm -hmm. trying to put six games together for these mid-major teams, I think they're great for a big upset and then they lose the next game. Right. You know? I don't. And I don't you know, see big runs for the mid-major teams. Not this you know, year. Picking up, picking a Cinderella is very tough. I mean, how how are you going to pick a Cinderella out of these sixty-four? Sorry. Previous years, you, previous years you had what? Florida Gulf Coast. You know, last year it was sure. FAU. Um, how do you pick these teams that are you know, fifteen seeds and go all the way? It's just really crazy. Yeah, to because a lot of times they weren't on TV very much. Uh, their competition was lower, but that doesn't mean that you know. That that Cinderella team smashes them by forty points or something. It's hard to gauge how they would do against a Kentucky or a Kansas. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's why it gets complicated. Well, I do know that this is going to be a great tournament. I think there's going to be a lot of really great games. I'm yeah, I think excited. so. I'm very excited about it. Because some next... of the mid majors, by the way, did play harder schedules and have very impressive yeah. resumes and wins, and they're going to be really dangerous. So. You have yeah. both of that this year, which is interesting. Some and of just, these, some of these mid-major teams are going to get blown out, <laughs> like, and some of them are going to pull the upset. So it's going to be and really just, cool. Just because I'm picking a lot of the blue bloods and the favorites to win this year does not mean that there isn't parity in college basketball. There's more parity every single year, and the mid-majors yeah. they have caught up. They really have with the transfer, transfer portal, portal taking care of that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, the talent level in college basketball is much more spread out than it used to be. It's across many, many more programs. Ironically, Transfer Portal has done the opposite in college football. It's actually concentrating talent in the smaller groupings of programs, really the Big Ten and the SEC mainly. So You know uh, what, though? The Transfer Portal has had a different not, effect on the two sports. Not to go too far off the reservation on football, but I think it's more NIL – is what's drawing the big dollars to the big programs. That's that's more than the transfer portal. I'm not sure the transfer portal is why there's not parity. I think it's NIL is extremely strong in football and less so in the other sports. So yeah, there's not many programs, not many programs that can bid for Shador Sanders and give him, you know, five million a year. It's just very yeah. few programs that can do that. So, or it, or offer Caleb Williams, you know, ten million to stay. Or um, no, not Caleb Williams. Marvin Harrison. Um, Marvin Harrison Jr. Ten million yeah. to stay at Ohio State, uh, and he'll take a pay cut to go to the NFL. That's crazy, you know. Mm -hmm. NIL yeah. is is huge for football. It's less so impactful. It exists in the other sports, but not as much of a driver mm -hmm. of of right. people going to schools because of NIL. It's interesting. I don't know if you noticed the last two days, Rob, but um, about half the commercials have Caitlin Clark in them. And yeah. so there's no doubt it's had an impact. It's had an impact on the women's side, too, with Caitlin Clark and with yeah. Angela Reese and all the stars. On yeah, that I, side. Just, started, I saw a commercial with her a few minutes ago. Yeah, she's a multimillionaire now. But That's I'm Caitlin. also seeing um, Baycott from Carolina in commercials and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so. Anyway, I saw and I saw Burns in a commercial from NC State. <laughs> he was in a Subway commercial. So yeah, yeah it's uh, it's definitely changing sports. Let's take a look at Pat Ford's bracket. He's another one that I look at every single year. He's usually really pretty accurate. And you'll notice here that what he's got coming out of the East, a uh, UConn versus Iowa State, very similar to what my bracket looks like out of the East. He's got UConn winning there, going to the final, and then being the eventual champion. UConn repeating for a second year in a row. Out of the West, he's got St. Mary's blasting through and, and doing some big upsets here, including North Carolina. St. Mm. Mary's is a really sneaky good team, and I, I kind of agree with that. I think they're North Carolina. Yeah, they have a lot of tournament experience now, you know. 
she, North Carolina cannot take them lightly. They play really solid basketball. Uh, and they've got them beating uh, and playing Baylor and then Baylor going ahead and going to the final four. Um, out of the Midwest, they, they've got Purdue and Creighton. They've got Creighton as the one who knocks Purdue off in okay. the Elite Eight, in the Elite Eight, which is certainly possible. Creighton plays mm-hmm. really good ball. Oh, yeah. And then you've got Houston coming out of the South by beating Marquette in the Elite Eight and, and getting to the final four and UConn beating them. So what are your thoughts about this final four pairing? I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't agree with all of it, but none of it strikes me as um, off the reservation. Every single one of the upsets I can imagine. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's an interesting take. I think there's too much pressure on UConn to do it again, but that doesn't mean that it's impossible. So I, I find this really interesting that the last two brackets we've looked at, they really gave Baylor a lot of cred here going all the way to the final four in both cases. And Mm-hmm. I really, I really, I respect Baylor, and they've been great in the previous couple of years. But I didn't really give them a lot of value this year. Maybe I made a mistake there. I don't know. But I have them going to the Elite Eight. I've got Creighton as one of my teams to watch. I'm really watching Creighton. I think they're very good, and they can knock some people off. So I have them in the Elite Eight too. Yeah, yeah, they're very good. Let's take a look at the last one here, and we're going to look at my bracket. Now, this is Stephen A. Smith, the very controversial. Um, announcer and uh, commentator on ESPN. And if you take a look at his teams here, um, it's a little bit blurred. Let me come in here. Uh, He's got UConn and um, Iowa State in the final eight. He's got uh, North Carolina playing. uh, Who is that? He's got, oh, Arizona, North Carolina, Arizona. Over here, he's got Texas A&M coming all the way through and upsetting all those big teams, including Houston and Duke. He had them playing Kentucky and and winning and going to the Final Four. Uh, And then down in the bottom bracket, similar to you, he's got Purdue coming out of the Midwest. Mm -hmm. um, And then he's got UConn winning the whole thing with UConn and Purdue, the top two teams, in my opinion, uh, both in the the final. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Um, Not bad. I mean, decent – strategies uh i don't see anything that's egregious it could happen my other team similar to creighton that i have kind of i'm watching out for is texas a&m the way they finished the season the way they won the sec tournament the way they they blew kentucky out in that tournament and um i just really think texas a&m is a really solid team um, and somebody to watch and i think that he's exactly right they could potentially even knock houston off in the second round wouldn't mm. be surprised. We'll see. Possible. Yeah. All right. Let's take a look at my bracket now. Uh, let me go ahead and find it. Um, let me come back to you, and I'm going to go ahead and pull it up. You have your bracket up so we can compare notes here. Um, I don't have it up. I just have I have it in front of me. Okay. So I'm going to show you what I've got. I do. I did fill out three brackets this year: two on YouTube, uh, one, uh, two on on Yahoo, and one on ESPN. So you, you can just tell me what you think here. Uh, let's talk about the East. I've got uh, Connecticut playing Auburn in the East, and then Connecticut eventually playing Illinois in the Elite Eight and Connecticut being the representative out of the East. So I really think Illinois is a fantastic team, and I can really see these two teams being the final two teams in that bracket. I really like Drake as well, um, but I think that Drake's going to run into a buzzsaw when it comes to Illinois. And when it comes to Connecticut-Auburn up top, you've mentioned that game. You have Auburn coming out on top. I've got Connecticut coming out on top. I think that could be one of the best games in the entire tournament. I think it's going to be a really great game. Uh, similar to Stephen A. Smith coming out of the South, I've got Texas A&M surprising and beating Houston and eventually beating uh, Wisconsin as well. And then I've got Texas Tech coming out of the lower half of the bracket. I've got Texas A&M and Texas Tech in the Elite Eight in the South um, coming out of that bracket. And I've got Texas Tech going to the Final Four. 
So that's my only team that is anything below a number four seed. They're the number nine seed out of that bracket. Coming down to the West, uh, I've got North Carolina playing Alabama. I think that's going to be a really fantastic game. You mentioned Alabama being really, really good. I, uh, I do believe Carolina will prevail in that game. It'll be a slugfest. Um, I've got New Mexico as a team to watch coming up and getting all the way to the Sweet 16 and then losing to Arizona. And I've got the one and two seed in that bracket, uh, the Blue Bloods playing for the West with North Carolina taking, uh, taking that game. Coming out of the Midwest, I've got uh, Purdue beating Gonzaga. I think that's going to be one of the best games in the tournament. I can't wait to watch that one if it does occur. And then out of the lower half of the bracket, the two teams that I really like out of the lower half are Creighton and Tennessee. I think they're both fantastic. I really watched Creighton. And I think Purdue Creighton go heads up for the trip to the Final Four. And as you can see, I have Creighton knocking off Purdue and Purdue not making it to the Final Four. So then my, my, my Final Four is North Carolina, Connecticut, Texas A&M, and Creighton, with Connecticut taking the championship. Thoughts? I mean, it could easily happen, all of it. Creighton being up that far is a little surprising, but I think it's surprising would be for, surprising too. But I was thinking to myself, okay, it never happens where it's all ones and twos in the final four. It just never happens. And no, so I agree got, with that. You've got to find a way to get some some teams that are a little bit lower seed in there because that's more realistic. Yeah. As to what's going well, on. yeah, but that's the big question is which ones because you know, in yeah. retrospect, when you call for a an upset and it misses, you look kind of dumb like, not you, but it looks silly when you're saying, you know, nobody's state is going to knock off Kentucky and they get blasted by 40, and you're like, whoops, <laughs> yeah, of course, it looks like you don't know what you're talking about. It's hard to call upsets. Um, Absolutely. Although I will say there are several where Vegas has the odds on the lower, um, the the higher seed, the higher numbered seed. So um, the team that's supposed to lose is favored. So that's mm -hmm. interesting. Um, several several cases of that so far, and I think that's because Vegas doesn't trust the seeding as well. So mm -hmm. some of that seeding, um, sometimes teams are seeded wrong. They're um, too high or too low, and uh, they're right for the the pulling off the upset or, or being upset themselves. So mm -hmm. I, I think your bracket looks pretty good. I think that the Creighton side is is weaker, but it could happen. You know, people could get people could get um, fired up at the right yeah. time. That's the part you can't predict is is the momentum piece, especially yeah. since this tournament is strung out over several weeks, and you can really lose the momentum uh, when you go back to school and you kind of wait. In your in your uh, dorm or your apartment, you know, and going to practice and and is it is it possible that Purdue actually squeaks this game out against Creighton and that they're in the final four and then they end up in the final game against Connecticut? Of course, and I think that every NCAA commissioner would want that matchup. That would be maybe might have the highest ratings ever. UConn versus yeah. Purdue. So that's probably the matchup that they want. I just don't think it's going to happen. I just think Purdue is snake bit. I think they have the best player in the country, and they just somehow never yeah. get. It. So, so let's talk about your top eight. Uh, who do you have coming out of the East in the two semifinal games of the final game? Um, I have Auburn beating UConn to to get to the okay. Elite Eight uh, against Iowa State, okay. um, and I have Iowa State advancing from that game. Uh, in and the West, see, I have Alabama see, against Arizona. And you see why I don't have Iowa State, because I, I have Drake knocking them off. I think Drake is right. sneaky. Okay, down the West? In the West, I have Alabama against Arizona. Alabama, uh, Alabama knocking off UNC to advance against Arizona, and I have okay. Alabama going um, past Arizona in a okay. really good one. Do you think it'll be up here? you think it's going to be uh, – who did you have? Auburn versus Auburn, Iowa State against Al and then Alabama, Arizona. And out of those, Alabama and Iowa State um, advance. Okay, so you have Iowa State and Alabama in this side of the final four. Yeah. Okay. Got it. 
up here and in the then, south? South, I have Houston against Kentucky, which can't happen now. So that part's okay. wide open. Okay. Um, but I have Houston advancing out of that. Uh, and then in the Midwest, I have Purdue against Creighton, and I have Purdue advancing. So in Purdue against Houston, I have Purdue winning. And okay. in Alabama against Iowa State, I have Alabama winning. And I have Purdue, Alabama in the um, championship game. Okay. And, and I have Purdue winning the whole thing. Okay. All right. I think that's certainly viable. Yeah. Let's see if Purdue can get over the hump that they've been struggling with for a couple of years now. It'll be really interesting. You know, it's interesting. My final four teams, um, Iowa State – is uh, the fourth best scoring defense in the country. Uh, mm -hmm. They were second in the Big 12. Um, and then you have another great best scoring defense. Um, number one best scoring defense is Houston. So two of my four are, the, are way at the top in scoring defense. Mm -hmm. And Alabama is the highest scoring team in the country. And they were fourth in the SEC uh, because they scored 90.8 um, points a game. 90.8. Mm -hmm. And they gave up 81.1. So not much defense there. Um, mm -hmm. So strong on the offensive side. And then Purdue is, um, you know, very good offensive team. They score 83.4 um, points a game. They give up 70.2. So that's a pretty good um, point differential. And they have, they're the second best rebounding team in the country. Mm -hmm. And they've got some serious scores. They have, the number one offensive player in the country, Edie. Uh, mm -hmm. And he scores 24.4 points a game. So he's just a monster. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they have a very good defense as well. So they, uh, they're, you know, their rebounding is, is excellent. You don't get a lot your, of multiple your opportunities. Bracket, your bracket could certainly happen. I think Purdue only wins six straight if they can hit some shots because they're going to collapse on Edie. It's just like when Samson was playing for Virginia. No, I agree. And it is it is going to require certain times um, to have somebody step up other than Edie. No question. But I think they I think they got the team to do it. They have that the the overall team. They've got the 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 experience. Um, mm -hmm. they've got really good players. And every team wants to stop Edie, and he's averaging 24.4 points a game. So it's not as easy. It's like saying go block Aaron Donald. You know, <laughs> uh, it's not so easy just to do. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, you commit a bunch of guys to him, but then some of the other guys are getting much easier shots than they would normally have, and they're going to probably knock them down. So yeah, um, well, let's talk about uh, our let's talk about our sneaky teams that we are kind of watching in each bracket. For me, in the East, it's um, uh, Drake. I really think Drake is one of those 10 seeds that can really make a deep run here. The only reason I have them losing at all is because my other sneaky good team is Illinois. I think Illinois, especially after watching them today, after what they did in the Big Ten to win the Big mm -hmm. Ten championship, I think Illinois has the, the cred to go all the way to the Final Four. I really do. Um, if they knock off Connecticut, I will not be surprised um, because they, especially the center they have that I saw today, he's the most dynamic center both blocking mm -hmm. shots and running the floor like Zion and Williamson. It was unbelievable. Yeah. So, good. so um, I'm looking at Drake. I'm looking at Illinois. And the other team that's sneaky is um, San Diego State. Everybody yeah. might remember last year in 2023, they went to the Final Four, surprisingly. Nobody could mm -hmm. believe it. Uh, they, and they have almost their entire uh, team back. They only lost one senior from last year's team. So would I be surprised if they knocked off Auburn? No, I wouldn't because they, they have that kind of uh, experience now. Uh, so those are the three teams in the East that I'm kind of sneaky on. Over I'm, I'm going to say I'm going to say Oakland because they just beat Kentucky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah right. uh, obviously, they're, they're pretty sneaky. Um, JMU, sneaky. Yep, I like JMU. Very much so. I agree with um, you, JMU. My, my two sneaky teams in the South are the two that I've got here in the Elite Eight, and that's Texas A&M and Texas Tech. A&M, because of the damage that they did in the SEC, surprisingly, they came out of nowhere and at the end of the year. They feel a lot like NC State. They really peaked at the right time. Texas Tech, because they've got um, this 
battle-tested credo every year. They're going really, really deep. Elite eights, final fours. Of course, in 2019, uh, played Virginia in the final. Uh, they're just a really solid team. So I really like those two sneaky teams in the south. Um, coming down here to the west, my sneaky teams down here. Uh, one of them actually lost today. That was Nevada. I really like Nevada. And, mm -hmm. of course, they didn't get it done. Uh, I really like New Mexico. Uh, a lot of people are not talking about them, but they have two of the best guards in the country. Uh, and they are the kind of team that are built to upset somebody. So all the brackets we've seen today about Baylor are going really deep. That may, okay. may hinge on whether they can get past um, New Mexico. I've got New Mexico actually beating Baylor in my bracket. Um, uh, another sneaky team, St. Mary's. We talked about them. They, they're the kind of team that are built to make a really deep run, potentially even Final Four. Um, and then, uh, of course, I have Alabama as well as being. A, yeah, I a think role. Alabama is going to be one of the most exciting teams to watch yeah. because they're just so fast and so such yep. high scoring, such high flying. It's like greatest show on turf kind of in basketball. Um, mm -hmm. They're going to be fun to watch. They're going to be kind of like five slam pajama. They just got some pizzazz, you know. No question about it. Sneaky teams on the Midwest. And I don't even know why I call them sneaky at this point, but Gonzaga. Um Everybody's been kind of disrespecting them this year and say that they're slipping and their program's fading. And I just don't see it. <laughs> I mean, they I blew, up, they blew out in East today. Um, would anybody be surprised if Gonzaga goes to the Final Four and knocks off Purdue? I wouldn't. Not really. You know, I mean, they, they I would be shocked. Them. I just don't think it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen either. You see, I've got them losing to Kansas. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, I'm sorry. No, losing to Purdue. Losing to Purdue up here. Um, my number one sneaky team out of the uh, Midwest, of course, is Creighton. Uh, the Blue Jays, they have the uh, the most seniority of anybody in that bracket. They're starting four out of five of their players are seniors and have um, – this is their fourth tournament. So I really bank a lot of my um, predictions here on Creighton going uh, all the way here to the Elite Eight on um, mm -hmm. their ability to – to uh, leverage that experience that they have. And then eventually, obviously, they're my surprise final four pick. Any sneaky teams down here in the Midwest for you? Uh, it's Creighton. Yep, Creighton. By the way, I really like Oregon, too. I liked what I saw from them today. And the only reason I don't have them going deeper is because they unfortunately run into Creighton, who I've got ranked a little bit mm -hmm. higher, but, but mm -hmm. I really like Oregon. I think they're playing really well. And I wouldn't discount Tennessee. I mean, there's no reason that they couldn't knock Creighton off. I mean, they have the, yeah. the scoring the offense to do it. There's a lot of good games this year. I'm really kind of excited to see what comes out. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Mm -hmm. Any other dark horses, fun games you're looking for watching in week one of the tournament? No. Um... I mean, there's so many. It's kind of hard to pinpoint. Um, I just think some of the matchups are just going to keep getting better and better. Actually, you know, they say every year that you you really want the upsets to happen in week one. Uh, and then you want the blue bloods that survive to really go forward because that mm -hmm. drives the, the ratings. Mm -hmm. If you end up with um, mid-major unknown teams in the finals, ratings actually are really low. So... You want the upsets in the round of 64 and 32, but then you want it to hone mm -hmm. into the predictable. And um, that's kind of the, the pattern you want. You want some upsets. You want to, you want to yeah. throw, you know, throw it open a little bit and uh, upsets else, do that. Or else it's not madness, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Absolutely so, agree. So I have an interesting um, thing I came across with uh, six statistics that predict the national title. Oh, okay. um, so the first thing is um, that the teams um, in the top 12 uh, in the, in week six in the AP poll, in the AP poll. Uh, so what they're saying is that since 2004, every team that, was in contention was pretty good in the month of December. So mm -hmm. the teams that get better at the end don't actually end up winning the whole thing, statistically speaking. 
Mm-hmm. So basically, if you're in the top 12 in week six in the AP poll, um, that eliminates uh, 56 of the 68 teams. Okay. So you're automatically down to, to 12 teams right there. So 64 down to, um, or 68 teams down to, to, uh, to 12. There's Houston, UNC, um, Oklahoma, Purdue, Yukon, Baylor, Kansas, Marquette, Arizona, Creighton, Tennessee, and Gonzaga are still alive. The second criteria is since 1993, every winner has made at least the semifinals of their con- conference tournament. Yes, I so did that, see that. So that's like 31 year sample size. Um, that eliminates more teams. Uh, now you're left with Houston. Qualifying would be Houston, UNC, Arizona, Purdue, Yukon, uh, Baylor, Gonzaga, and Marquette all made at least the semifinals of their tournament. Right. Criteria three. Every champion is in the top six in the Ken Palm ratings. Mm-hmm. Um, that takes you down to four teams, Houston, Arizona, Purdue, and UConn. Mm-hmm. The fourth criteria um, predictor, every champion, um, every champion is in the top 75 in three-point percentage uh, over the last five years. And that leaves Arizona, Purdue, and UConn. So Mm -hmm. they all have to be pretty good in three-point shooting. If you can't shoot the three, then you're probably not going to make it. And then five is um, there hasn't been a repeat winner in 17 years. Mm -hmm. So that takes out UConn. That leaves Purdue and Arizona. And then a team from the West has never won in 25 years. So 25 straight years, no one from the West. And that's how they arrived um at purdue and i i agreed with that rationale so i said this this fits perfectly to what i think is kind of going to except that the only thing i'd say to that is except that you know someone's eventually going to repeat again it's not like yeah happen, but so. it could be 20 years from now <laughs> like yeah, it's it's, a, it's, it a, it's be, kind of a unicorn event you know it's or it could, be this year. Event. could be this year i think it's almost impossible in the, in the era of i think it's more impossible than it's ever been with with NIL and transfer portal, um, people are not staying and helping repeat with the same outstanding cast. You right. might have a great player transfer and help another team win. Like right. that's probably more likely than a repeat and that, team. And that's why my rationale was that UConn actually will do it this year because they kept their whole team intact from last year's champions and added two phenom freshmen. So. Yeah, but it's some other teams, what they're able to do. But other teams are improving faster by bringing in talent. So it's um, I think it's going to be harder than it's ever been to repeat. No, there's no doubt. Uh, the other stat you didn't mention that I thought was interesting is no one has ever won the championship being outside the Ken, ba- Ken Palm defensive rankings below 30th, mm-hmm. uh, except for one team in 70 years, and that was UConn the last time they won the championship. They were mm-hmm. actually ranked ranked 32nd in the Ken Palm that year. So, you know, mm-hmm. that that narrows the field, narrows the field even more. You know, teams like Tennessee, who's ranked like 101st in defensive efficiency. Yeah. They're not going to Alabama, make it. Alabama's like 78th in defensive not efficiency. Not going to make it. So, uh, Kentucky was like one of the worst defensive teams the whole year. So, I, I knew they weren't going to make yeah. it. I knew they were going to maybe win one or two games. But yeah. We saw what happened today. I think, so I think offense can carry you for a few rounds and you can be blowing out teams you're supposed to and all that. But when it gets really down grinding um, to that, you know, you're down by four with 18 seconds left and, you know, it's, you need a stop and everything. It just, I think I the selection committee doesn't always get it right. But I think this year they did pick the best four teams as the number one seeds. I really do. And I think that um, out of those four, Houston's the the least good team has the least chance. I would I would say UConn, Purdue have the best chance. North Carolina the third best chance, and um, mm-hmm. uh, I think Houston is very unlikely to win. So I think it's going to be one of those three. It was definitely interesting to watch all these turn tournament champions um, lose. So what I mean is the tournament was one most of the tournaments were won by a team that shouldn't have won it or was was a surprise um a lot of number one seeds went in and lost in the tournament championships 
So that's if you look, if you look back at the, all the years the champions win the NCAA tournament, they almost always lose in their in their top conference yeah. tournament. That's the right. The year that the year that Virginia won in 2019, they lost in the conference final that year. So yeah, it's pretty common. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be really exciting and uh, really it already happy, is. <laughs> happy you guys joined us for this um, journey into March Madness, one of Rob and my favorite times of the year. So exciting. You know what I'm going to be doing all weekend. And uh, those of you who uh, are deciding to take advantage of some of the new betting laws, like Rob and I are a little bit, um, you know, bet safely and uh, really enjoy these games. This will be a lot of fun. And we'll be back in a future, future episode very soon. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Looks like I picked the wrong week to uh, get a University of Kentucky jersey on the way. That's right. Take care, everybody. Bye.